Jesus is Lord. This is the way we always begin our program. Say it again. Jesus is Lord. Think about what that means. Jesus, Savior, God. He became a man. He's Lord. He's taken over our lives because we ask him to. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. Think of what it means that Jesus is alive. If it wasn't for Jesus, there'd be no reason for us to go on. There'd be no reason for us to live. There'd be no hope for the future. We would be totally overwhelmed and almost traumatized by death if it wasn't for Jesus. Would life be worth living? No. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. This is Daily Bread. I'm Father Al Lauer. We're in the middle of a series on prophecy, the spiritual gift of prophecy. And you may not know much about it. Well, let's listen. I think God will tell you a few things. God might not just tell you things. It's not just information. It's communication. He may give you that gift. You may already have it and you don't even know it. You certainly need to get the benefit of this gift. So we'll not only teach about it, we'll pray about it, we'll worship about it. We want you to join with us. Now, don't just stare at us as we gather to worship. We want you to stand or kneel or whatever and you worship with us, okay? So, Father, send your spirit. Satan, we just throw you out. And Jesus, we just ask that you be the Lord right now. Lord, you're worthy to be praised. We're excited about your death and your resurrection. We're excited about the chance to just publicly acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we praise you. Precious Lord and Savior, Jesus. Name above all names, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glorious Savior. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jesus.
uh, we're just acting normal. If somebody dead just walked in the room right now, the normal thing to do would just be to yell and scream. Well, Jesus is risen from the dead, and he's in the room right now. Okay? We're going to ask forgiveness now. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? We just want to sprinkle you all with this water, reminding us that we are to be cleansed of our sins because we're children of God. Okay? Let's ask forgiveness. Uh, Jesus, there are people who are not uh, letting you speak to them. May they change. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, you're so merciful. You'll forgive any sin we ask you to forgive, no matter how bad, no matter how perverted, no matter how sick. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Jesus, you are pure and holy and perfect, and you call us to be perfect as you are perfect, as the Father is perfect. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, right now there are people watching this program, and they're getting into a mood of being a spectator. And yet you want them to be a participant. You want to work with them. You want to deal with them. You want to move in their lives. They don't understand that when you're talked about on television, you can minister to each one individually. And they don't have to just look in. They can receive. Lord, may that one receive salvation, that one deliverance, that one repentance, that one reconciliation, that one freedom from resentment, that one a breaking of bonds. That one a gift of purity, that one a vocation for life. In Jesus' name, Satan, we throw you out. Jesus be the Lord. Amen. Okay, we're continuing teaching about prophecy. We're going to talk today about a prophetic lifestyle. And our opening reading is from Ezekiel. A reading from Ezekiel, chapter 2, verse 2. As he spoke to me, spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard the one who was speaking say to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelite rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have revolted against me to this very day. Hard of face and obstinate of heart are they to whom I am sending you. But you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they heed or resist, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mark. Did you hear that last verse? Whether they heed or resist, no matter what their reaction to the prophecy, they're a rebellious house, so you kind of know what the reaction is going to be. They shall know that a prophet has been among them. There's something about a prophet. Whether you accept him or her or whether you don't accept him, it doesn't make that much difference because you know for sure that's a prophet. Sure, it makes a difference for your salvation, but you know it's a prophet no matter what your reaction Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 33 says the same thing. 33 and 33. When it comes, the fulfillment of the prophecy, it will surely come. They shall know that there was a prophet among them. Prophets have a way of living in such a way that it's pretty hard to not notice them. It's pretty hard to not realize who they're trying to speak for. And that is the Lord. Now you might not accept it because you don't accept the Lord. But you know a prophet has been in your midst. Now some of you who have been following this series and some of you who have just been open to the Lord are considering whether you have a gift of prophecy. Now we're going to talk about whether you have the gift a little later. But um, for today we just want to give you a picture of the prophetic lifestyle. You see what I mean? 
You've got to get a new lifestyle to accommodate the gift of prophecy. It says in Luke chapter 5 and verse 38 that we receive new wine, and that means the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And in order to hold that new wine, you need a new wine skin, all right? A new wine skin. What's a wine skin? That's our lifestyle. It's the way we live. That's, the, that's how we, uh, what, what is the container for our life? And so we need a lifestyle appropriate to the gift of prophecy. Now I'm going to give five biblical characteristics of a prophetic lifestyle. I'll list them ahead of time just so you'll see the order of the presentation. Faith, obedience, love, boldness, community. Those are the five. Faith, obedience, love, boldness, and community. If I had to pick five characteristics of, of a prophetic lifestyle, those would be the five that I pick. Now remember, you've got to get the prophetic lifestyle. You've got to get the wine skin to go along with the new wine of the gift of prophecy. Now, let's look at Romans chapter 4 and verse 16. First one, a prophet's got to be a man or a woman of faith. Now, of course, every Christian needs this, but prophets need it even more so. And prophetesses need it even more so. Romans 4, 16. It says, all depends on faith. Everything is a grace. Now, that means prophecy depends on faith. It's part of the all. You cannot exercise your gift of prophecy unless you are exercising faith. In fact, not just faith enough to get you into the kingdom, but faith more so than that. You need an extra special gift of faith. The reason I say that is because of Romans chapter 12, and verse 6. Look at this. It talks about a number of gifts of the Spirit. Romans 12, 6. We have gifts that differ According to the favor bestowed on each of us, now listen to this, one's gift may be prophecy. The next sentence. Its use should be in proportion to his faith. Its use should be in proportion to faith. Now, if you have a great prophetic message, but little faith, you won't be able to share that great prophetic message because you can only use the gift of prophecy in proportion to your faith. So if you've got a great prophetic message, you have to have great faith or you won't be able to share the great prophetic message. I think that's why we're not hearing a lot of the great prophetic messages of today. There's not a faith that goes with them. Now, why does God set it up like that? Well, say you have a prophetic message um, like some people had a prophetic message of, of World War II. Mary had that at Fatima. Uh, how come she shared it? She probably was the only one that had enough faith so that she could use her, pro her prophecy in proportion to faith. Other people, when they would talk about World War II, because they didn't have much faith, they couldn't see beyond the disaster. You know what I mean? And if they couldn't see beyond the disaster, instead of a prophecy that would be a warning to protect, a warning to guide, a warning to lead to victory, it would be, a it would be just a totally despairing thing. You see, if you don't have faith, I've heard people, I've given prophecies over my proportion of faith. I had a prophecy, I, I said that a person was, was going to have a family breakdown because you could just see it, the way they were living. It wasn't just a gift of wisdom, I think it was prophecy. But by the time I shared it, they were totally in despair. Well, I didn't have enough faith to see, be, to see more. You know, Faith is confident assurance about what we can't see. You know what I mean? And, and so I couldn't tell them. And yes, but God is telling you this, not to just say the family breakdown is the final word, but the Lord's dividing the family. He's dividing the family in order to reassemble it and make it even better than ever. I didn't have enough faith for that. And so the prophecy did not come out right. It did not get the right spirit. Do you, do you see what I'm talking about? So you have to have faith. Say, like I told you about that Antioch church prophecy that Paul and Barnabas were going to be sent out on mission. What if Paul and Barnabas didn't have much faith? 
This is what happens in a lot of our prayer gatherings. Maybe you were praying and God really gave at, at your last uh, Sunday Mass, He gave a prophecy, a real true prophecy to you that two people in your congregation would be sent out in foreign missions. And then you say, and you go and you tell them, guess what? They just stare at you and say, I can't go. I, I don't know what to do. Uh, well, see, they don't have any faith. And maybe you don't have that much faith. And when you shared it, you wouldn't share it with encouragement. You'd share it with discouragement. But so you see, you've got to have faith. That's why the prophetic lifestyle is a faith-filled lifestyle. Okay, the second characteristic, obedience. Very simply, prophets obey or die. You've heard the expression, to whom much has been given, much will be expected. In the scriptures, Luke. Much has been given to a prophet, and much is expected of a prophet. And if prophets have a stricter account, if, if they disobey, God's just really going to come down on them. Because that's just going to ruin so many people. So God's got to be strict with a prophet. So you either obey or you die. Simple as that. In 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 11, as a prophet, he didn't obey, he died. Or uh, I'll read Jeremiah uh, 28. Uh, Jeremiah 28, verse 17. Hananiah is a false prophet, and he preached peace, even though God wasn't saying peace. Guess what? Jeremiah 28, 17. That same year, in the seventh month, Hananiah, the prophet, died. Wow. <laughs> you can see. Now, probably after a couple more scriptures, everybody here is saying, boy, I, I better not be a prophet. Well, you know, if God calls you, you have to accept it. But, boy, it's a heavy-duty call because you mess up, you're dead. Simple as that. Micah chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. This is, uh, this is really something. Thus says the Lord regarding the prophets who lead my people astray, who when their teeth have something to bite announce peace, but when one fails to put something in their mouth, proclaim war against him. Now this, these prophets are not obeying. If they get some, if they, they just go with the highest bidder. If the highest bidder says prophesy peace, they say okay. Well, they're not listening to God, they're disobeying. Guess what happens to those prophets? Therefore you shall have night, not vision, but darkness, not divination. Listen to this. The sun shall go down upon the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. That's just a poetic way of saying these prophets are going to die. The sun's going to go down for them. So what I mean is a prophet obeys or dies. Simple. Simple as that. And not only physical death, but even what Revelation calls the second death, which could be, which is a, it's eternal damnation. I want to read a passage. Uh, I know these are hard to take. By the time I read all these passages, everybody will say, no, I don't want to be a prophet. Well, you don't, maybe you don't want to be, but if you're called, you need to be. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Here's a person who prophesied in a fantastic way. And um, I'm going to read into 22. The person cries out, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not exercised demons by its power? Did we not do many miracles in your name as well? So this group had a triple ministry of prophecy, of deliverance, and of miracles. Wow. Guess what? What did God have to say to them? I will declare to them solemnly, I never knew you out of my sight, you evildoers. Now here's a prophet, and on top of that, a deliverer, and on top of that, a miracle worker, and God looks that person straight in the eye and says, get out of here, I don't know you, you're an evildoer, go to hell. That's what it says. Prophets obey or die, or worse, are damned. They say, I'm never going to be a prophet then. Well, you don't have any choice about that, really. Well, you have a choice to refuse God's calling, but you don't have a choice on what calling you got. Okay, prophets are faith-filled. Prophets must be obedient or they die, or they're damned even. Third one, prophets speak out of love. You might say, a person yelling, you're going to hell, and that's love? Yes, it is. That's plenty of love. 
That's tough love. That's speaking the truth in love. Ephesians 4 and 15. No matter what kind of ministry we have, according to 1 Corinthians 13, 2, it, no matter if we prophesy in his name, but we did not have love, it would profit us nothing. Let me read that very quickly. I just I don't want to just refer to it. 1 Corinthians 13, 2. If I have the gift of prophecy, all right, and with full knowledge comprehend all mysteries, I'm the prophet of prophets. If I have faith great enough to move mountains, we said you got to have faith with prophecy. But one other thing you have, but have not love, I am nothing. A prophet must be a loving person. They may not come across as a loving person, but it's what you might call tough love. They care enough to tell you the truth. Okay? Faith, obedience, love. Now the fourth characteristic of a prophetic lifestyle is boldness. Obviously, prophets are called to be bold, and that is putting it mildly, very mildly. They are called to make a public witness, all, often in the midst of terrible hostility. They are called to do strange things in the worst places. you got to be really bold to be a prophet, and I mean a boldness that is way beyond any natural power. Some people are more open. They have very uh, outward going and almost uh, dramatic type personalities. It's more than that. It's more than any human personality, I'll tell you that. It's, it's fantastic what, what a prophet might be called to do. I'm just going to go through just a couple little highlights here because these will just blow you out. That's all I can say. Isaiah 20, verse 2. Now, the, the prophecy was the people were going to be led off into exile and be defeated. But it wasn't good enough just to say that. God told Isaiah to, um, to walk around naked for a period of, let's see, was, was it three years? Or I'm trying to find out how long he was supposed to walk around. Um, well, it was, it was quite some time. I think it was three years. So he was walking around naked and barefoot, which was the way a slave would walk around. And he did this for three years as a sign and a portent. Now you say, you got to be bold. You have to be bold to be a prophet like that. Okay, how about Jeremiah? He, you can see why Jeremiah constantly complained. When God puts you on the spot like this, this is pretty difficult. But look, look at Jeremiah. I'm going to read Jeremiah 19 and um, verse 14. He's told to go in front of the temple and give this big message about the temple being brought down. Now, that is not the ideal spot to give that message. <laughs> that is where you're going to get all your enemies. And, um, well, people got real mad at him and they arrested him. So you just go down right in front of the church and say, God's going to get rid of this church. You've got to have a lot of boldness to do that. Well, let's look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 4. Oh, and five, and gee, Ezekiel had to do all kinds of stuff. Like uh, in four, he had to get a clay tablet. He got a clay tablet, and then he um, built up a little, like a little game, just like a little miniature play set. And he played games, and he played little war games against this city that he drew on the clay tablet, and he built a little play tower, and he built a little miniature ramp, and he built little camps, and he had a little war set, you know, like a little kid playing games. And he got little battering rams, and, and then he had a lay on his, on his side for, uh, I forget, let's see, 390 days. So you go out and you see Ezekiel laying on his side for 390 days. <laughs> That's pretty right. Then he switches to the other side for a few hundred more days. And, oh, you read it for yourself, Ezekiel 4 and 5. Gosh, okay, the last quality. Faith, obedience, love, boldness, and then community. I think you realize, I hope you do, a lot of times we just picture everything individualistically just because of our prejudice. But there's really no such thing as a Lone Ranger prophet. Prophets lived in bands, groups, banded together. It's 1 Samuel 11, 5. Like, for example, John the Baptizer had a number of disciples. Um, a, Prophets have to be banded together for mutual protection because they just make enemies by the millions. And they need this band to protect themselves. And also, 
They need a band to do some of the dramatic representations of the prophecies. You need a whole cast of thousands sometimes. Well, maybe not thousands, but 10, 20, 30, 40 people. And so prophets are a communal gathering. So let's pray about these five things. Lord, may we have the gift of prophecy. May we make the decisions for a prophetic lifestyle so this gift of prophecy will not be wasted. Lord, may we be people of faith. May we be an obedient people, a loving people, a supernaturally bold people, and a people committed to unity in the body of Christ into Christian community. Lord, may we live a lifestyle that makes prophecy powerful. In Jesus' name, amen.